Hello, welcome to another video lecture. It is about two o'clock on the 15th of March. We've got all of the midterm exams graded. So if you didn't see the email I sent earlier today, take a look at your grades. Uh, today we're going to talk about Creoles and Caudillos. Uh, this is all about Latin America and what's going on in Latin America oh, in the early to mid 1800s or so. Uh, we're moving into more of that, uh, what we would call modern history at this point. All right, so let's start with causes of revolutions. Um, unlike the United States and France, Latin American revolutions, they're not caused by the intellectual components of the Enlightenment. What you find in the U.S. and what you find in, in France is life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, when it comes to Latin America, there's really just a limited awareness of the Enlightenment ideals. Uh, there's limited awareness of constitutionalism and social contracts. So if the intellectual components of revolutions aren't what started the Latin American revolutions, what is it? Well, the largest cause of Latin American revolutions was choosing between Napoleon or the royal families of Portugal and Spain, or the third option was complete independence. Uh, basically, they don't want to miss their shot at making change. Let's talk first about Argentina. Now, originally, the area today known as Argentina was the Viceroy of La Plata, and it included the modern day countries of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia. Most of these settlers, most of the people that lived there were Creoles. There were a few Amer Indians, and there were some slaves. And the Creoles were split between the Portenos of Buenos Aires and the Pampas of the Grasslands. And they had two different points of view. The Portenos of Buenos Aires, the, the urban people of Argentina, they were okay with colonialism. They liked things the way they were. They felt like they had power and that they were making money off of this colonialism. The Pampas, or the, the um, people living out in the grasslands, they preferred independence. And in many ways, they didn't even deal with the government at all. They almost lived outside of the government. The Viceroy of La Plata also has a dispute over Uruguay with Brazil. Both the Viceroy of La Plata and the colony of Brazil, which of course belong to Portugal, uh, they both claim some of the land that makes up Uruguay. In 1816, uh, Independence from Spain is going to be declared in Argentina. The wars of Napoleon are over and the people living in Argentina sees this as their shot, their chance to make something happen. Now, after independence, the elite in Buenos Aires, they're going to control the government. They're going to tell everybody what to do and not do. Uh, the people of the grassland, they're known as gauchos, and this is a picture of a gaucho here, uh, they are outside the government. The government has no say over them. They live extremely independently. Now, Uruguay, it doesn't actually become independent until 1828. And Argentina develops the constitution. The constitution is created in 1853, but it's not put into effect until 1861. Also in Argentina, we have a war. It's called the Paraguayan War, and it goes from 1864 to 1870. And this is all about land, a territorial dispute, not that unlike what's happening in the world today. Uh, you end up with a war where Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay are all fighting. And Paraguay is going to lose almost half of its population and about a third of its territory. It is the big loser from this war. And what ends up happening 
is South America realizes how much they need industry and how far behind they are in terms of warfare and development that the South American countries begin to industrialize so that they can catch up. Uh, the Argentine grasslands, by the way, they develop very similar to the American West. Uh, there's European immigration. There's a version of Manifest Destiny. If you've had U.S. history, uh, you know that there was this push to go towards the West Coast and that the land had been put there for Americans to settle and basically civilize, civilize the uh, savages, so to speak. In Argentina, they had that same idea, except it was their manifest destiny to go south instead of west. And the grasslands of Argentina, the gauchos, they become the Argentinian version of cowboys. And there are cattle ranches and cattle raising. And even today, Argentina has a very large cattle population and supplies a lot of food to the uh, to the world I guess you could say now let's look at Brazil Brazil was for a long time the colony of Portugal and it was ruled by the Portuguese royal family but it's eventually going to become the home of the Portuguese royal family in the Napoleonic era. When Napoleon takes over Spain and takes over Portugal, the royal family of Portugal leaves and settles in Brazil. And when the royal family of Portugal settles in Brazil, Brazil is given co-equal status with Portugal. It is as important, it is seen as an equal to the home country. Eventually, King Pedro I, he's going to be forced back to Portugal in 1820 by the nobles in Portugal. Uh, he doesn't go back to Portugal voluntarily. It's basically, if you don't come back, we're going to overthrow you. But he leaves his son, Pedro II, to be in charge of Brazil. And Pedro II is going to declare independence from his dad in Portugal in 1822. The government that Pedro II sets up, it will be a monarchy, and it's going to be a monarchy based on divine right. There's going to be... Um, like the Creole, the, the mixed European native land owning class of people are going to be the ones who support the monarchy. Now Pedro II, he does create a constitution in the year 1823 and this constitution gives him ultimate absolute power. The constitution is basically a formality just to make things look better than they really are. The Senate that's created is extremely weak and can't do anything. There are severely limited voting rights. Only a very small select group of people can vote. And Pedro II has the absolute right to name and dismiss government ministers at his whim and at his will. Now Pedro II, he will abdicate his throne in 1831. And he leaves his throne to his five-year-old son. Now, of course, a five-year-old son can't rule on his own. So there are regents set up, people who will advise and run the country while the king is too young to um, make legal choices. So these regents are going to give provincial governments the ability to elect legislative bodies. The regents are going to give these provincial governments the ability to set budgets and have power over the money. And these regents are also going to create a national guard to stop any revolts that happen. 
Pedro the Third, when he turns the age of fourteen, he's going to undo all the reforms. The reforms are all taken away, and a near absolute monarchy returns, and that constitution of eighteen twenty three is put back in place. Now, the economy in Brazil is remaining slave-based all the way up until the year 1888. That Brazil is going to be the last major country to do away with the slave trade officially. Now, that doesn't mean that attempts to stop the slave trade didn't begin earlier. Uh, pressure from Britain began to put pressure on the slave trade as early as the 1840s and it became a lot harder to import slaves in the 1840s because the British Royal Navy had anti-slave patrols that sailed between the coast of Brazil and the coast of Africa and of course at this point in time the British Royal Navy was the absolute strongest navy in the world and there weren't many people willing to go against them. Now, eventually, in 1889, the Army of Brazil, they orchestrated an overthrow, a coup of the government, if you will, because of how long it took to outlaw slavery. Now, the economy is also based on cotton and coffee, both before slavery and after slavery as well. Uh, there's also a group of urban elites in the city. Uh, you should probably know that as well. And the agriculturalists were pro-federalism. They were pro-giving power to the people. They were pro-giving power to the provinces. The urban elite in the cities were pro-authoritarian. They wanted a strong central government that told everybody what to do. Eventually, there's going to be a compromise made between the pro-federalist and the pro-authoritarian sides. And it's going to lead to some increases in coffee production. And eventually, once the coffee production craters in 1896 and the prices crash, uh, this compromise between the pro-federalist and pro-authoritarian sides will lead Brazil to switch to light industry, um, textiles, and food processing. Uh, today, Brazil does a lot of foreign, or I should say, foreign exports when it comes to the uh, food sector. Now, when it comes to Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, this was a Spanish viceroy known as the Viceroy of New Granada. The Viceroy of New Granada, it had the largest population of free black people and mulatto people. Uh, meaning, you know, African and European mix. And these mulatto people were known as pardos. And they made up about 50% of the population. They were almost the majority there. Now the pardos, these mulatto people, initially worked with the Creoles, who were native European mix, until 1811, when the pardos are going to have a coup against the Creoles. They're going to overthrow the government. Now eventually the Pardos themselves are overthrown when the Creoles declare independence from Spain in 1812. And unfortunately for the Creoles and the Pardos too, this independence is very short-lived because once Napoleon is defeated in Europe, the Spanish come back to the Viceroy of New Granada in 1814. We don't get permanent independence from Spain in the Viceroy of New Granada until 1819 when a man named Simon Bolivar leads a military force to defeat the Spanish. Now, Simon Bolivar, he didn't have any formal education, but he was at Napoleon's crowning known as a coronation in 1804. And all the pomp, circumstance, the regality, just the, the experience inspired Simon Bolivar to become this great leader. 
after the independence is won, Simon Bolivar will become the president of Gran Colombia in 1822, but Gran Colombia doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for very long. It doesn't exactly last. Now, in Venezuela, it's extremely unstable there, and that hasn't really changed a lot. Venezuela, even today in 2022, is a little bit unstable. Between the years 1830, when Venezuela got its independence from Gran Colombia, until the year 1900, there were over 40, over 40 presidents. Not only that, but there were more than 30 revolts. Now, I don't know how much clearer of a picture I can make of instability. 40 presidents, 30 revolts in a 70 year period. That's a new president less than every other year. Now the way it works is very uh, cyclical. Uh, there's a pattern of a strong man who takes control. This strong man promises change and it turns out he's a dictator just like the guy before him and he pockets all the foreign investment money. Now when you read an article called America in Danger, I think you'll see that there's the strong man who takes control, he does what he wants, and he uses this country for his own play, basically. Now in Colombia itself, uh, there's the War of a Thousand Days that breaks out in 1899, and it's between these Federalist forces and these authoritarian forces. And this will even spread to a revolt in modern-day Panama, where Panama is spun off from Colombia and becomes its own country. Now, the way this kind of works is the... Constitution of Colombia that was put into place in the 1860s is revoked in the middle of the 1880s. It leads to a, uh, a protest where the liberal part of the government protests against conservative government. And then in the middle of all this, uh, there's some separatists from the peninsula of Panama who join with the liberal side and they overthrow the government. And it also helps that there was, you know, some election fraud happening in there, too. Well, the United States gets involved with this War of a Thousand Days because they want to control of the construction of the Panama Canal. And the United States will openly help the revolutionaries in Panama win in exchange for a lease on the Panama Canal. And when Panama declares its independence and when Panama fights for its independence in the middle of this war of a thousand days, the United States is going to be the first country in the world to recognize Panama as an independent country. Now in Mexico, uh, more than anywhere else, uh, the revolution in Mexico is a direct result of Napoleon's takeover of Spain. Uh, when the Napoleonic takeover of Spain happens, uh, the colony of Mexico, they decide, well, should we remain loyal to the Viceroy, who is the, the Mexican representative t in Mexico, who's supposed to work with the, with the king? Or do they remain loyal to the king himself, who was deposed, removed from his, his throne, Fernando VII? So there's some of the Mexican people who say, let's remain loyal to the Viceroy, Another group say, let's remain loyal to King Fernando VII. And eventually those two sides are going to go to civil war when the king is returned to power in the year 1813 there in Spain. Eventually, when the War of Independence is over in 1821, it's decided that Mexico would be a constitutional empire. 
a constitution that abolished slavery was created, everyone was given equal citizenship, and there was a very strong legislature to keep something like a king from forming again. Now what ends this war is in 1821, there's a compromise between the nationalist leader Vicente uh, Guerrero and the royalist leader Augustine de Iturbide, and they agree Mexico should become an independent constitutional empire, but that empire lasts for only one year. In 1822, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Honduras all declare their independence from Mexico. So, can't really be a constitutional empire if you don't have an empire, and so the Mexican Republic will replace the Mexican Empire in the year 1824. A little bit of American history here. War between the United States and Mexico breaks out in 1845, uh, much because of these American settlers that are invited to move into Texas. Uh, the American settlers were invited into Texas because the Mexican government, well, they needed the tax money, and they needed help protecting their citizens from raids from the Comanche uh, tribe or the Comanche um, ethnic group. Now, the American settlers, they agreed to leave their slaves at home and convert to Catholicism, and they didn't do either one of those. They, did, they didn't let their slaves free. They said these are lifelong indentured servants, and they didn't convert to Catholicism. They still practiced their Anglican or, or Methodist or Baptist or whatever you name it ways instead of becoming Catholic. Uh, things come to a head... Uh, by 1835, where the American settlers refuse to pay Mexican taxes, and Texas is going to go on to declare its independence in 1836. Something, something, the Alamo happens, and um, the Mexican leader Santa Ana is going to try and take the Alamo back. He does, but the Texans end up defeating the army of Santa Ana, and the war is going to be over by 1836, the end of it. Texas is going to petition the United States to let it in as a state, and Texas is told no thank you, and Texas ends up being its own country all the way from 1836 till 1845. It's not until the end of the Mexican-American War in 1846 that Texas officially joins with the United States. Now, after the Mexican-American War, Mexico stabilizes under the leadership of a guy named Porfirio Diaz, who's going to bring in some industrialization, going to improve the infrastructure, and it looks like things are going to be okay. 1876, Diaz comes to power, and he's in power until 1911, but a civil war breaks out in the year 1910, unfortunately. Now, Diaz was accused of manipulating the 1910 elections by an opposition leader named Francisco Madero. And yes, Diaz was definitely manipulating the vote. But Madero is going to call on middle class Mexicans and working class Mexicans to rise up and protest and revolt against Diaz. Now, one supporter of Madero, a, a man named Pancho Villa, he begins to take over plantations in the state of Chihuahua and redistributed land to the peasants. Another leader of this movement, Emiliano Zapata, defeats federal troops near Mexico City, and that led to Diaz fleeing the country, and Madero is named the new president. Eventually, a pro-Diaz counter-revolution rises up against Pancho Villa and Zapata and Madero, and the war continues. Now, eventually, the constitutionalist forces win the war. Everything 
it goes back to the way it was, with the exception of s Mexican people get some limited reforms to the working class and some limited reforms to the middle class, and it's just enough to convince those two groups of people to go along with the status quo. So there's a revolution, then there's a counter-revolution, the counter-revolution beats the revolution, and things kind of go back to the way they were with a couple of small tweaks. All right. Uh, something else I want to go over here for a moment is on April 25th, your museum review is due. And I don't think I've had any museum reviews turned in yet for this class. So I want to give you a quick reminder. Number one, the museum reviews can be turned in at any time up to and including April 25th. So if you take a look at the syllabus itself, the museum exhibit review is on page four and page five. I'm sorry, it's page five and page six. And it says students are expected to visit one of the following history museums and then write a two and a half to three page double spaced review of the museum. Your first page should include your thoughts and opinions of the museum similar to a reflection paper. The remainder should be a historical critique of the museum. To do this, please consider questions such as the following. Number one, does the museum explain the exhibits adequately? Number two, does the layout of the museum make sense? Number three, is there something the museum does exceedingly well? And number four, is there something the museum needs to improve on? Now, just another quick refresher. There's a whole bunch of museums here. It's in alphabetical order. Each one of these is a clickable link. I've tried to put some that are close by, some that are far away. Some are about $20, some are free. There are some museums on the 60s, civil rights. There are some ex museums on modern history. There are some museums about civil war, revolutionary war, you name it. There's quite a few different things here. If you go to a Georgia State Park, there is a park pass you can check out from the library. So if you're somebody who maybe wants to go see the Little White House or something like that, the Little White House charges $12 a person. But if you go to the public library and you check out the Georgia Park Pass, you can get six people in for absolutely free. So keep those things in mind as you're looking at this list. Also, some of them have student ID discounts. If you are somebody who does not have your West Georgia Technical College student ID, for whatever reason that might be, you can get those made at the libraries. And then that will give you a discount on a few places like the Bremen Holocaust Museum, It'll give you a discount at the Atlanta History Center, and even the National Civil War Naval Museum in Columbus will give you a discount. So take a little bit of time, look through this list of museums found on the syllabus, click on a couple of links, and start thinking about which museum you would like to go to. When you go to your museum, Keep in mind some of the questions I asked, and you're not at all limited to these questions. You can think of other things too. But for example, does the museum explain the exhibit its exhibits adequately? When you're looking at your museum that you choose to go to, does it make sense? Are there plaques that tell you what you're looking at, or are you completely clueless in trying to figure it out on your own? Does the layout of the museum make sense? Sometimes museums have a certain path you need to follow. Sometimes it's a free-for-all look at anything you want to. And I want you to kind of take a minute to think about what layout the museum has chosen to use and whether you think it works or not. And if it does work, explain why you think it does. If it does not work, then tell me what you can do that's different. Is there something the museum does exceedingly well? Like if you go to the museum, are you just blown away by something and like, wow, I cannot believe they did it this well. A great example 
Uh, here in Carrollton, there is the Southeastern Quilt and Textile Museum. Uh, people always scoff at that. They're like, I don't want to go see a bunch of quilts. But when they go there, they find out that the tour guides, the docents as they're called, know absolutely everything and anything about what they're showing and people leave learning. Um, another thing people do really well, um, the Atlanta History Center, it's very immersive. It makes you really appreciate the history that surrounds Atlanta. And then the fourth question I want you to think about, does the museum need to improve something? I had somebody go to the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library once and they said it could be improved by having a snack bar. They were hungry when they went, but it's something they thought could be improved upon. Now, if anybody does watch this video, and if you send me between today, which is the 15th of March, and next Tuesday, which is the 21st of, or I'm sorry, next Monday, the 21st of March, so anytime between today, Tuesday, the 15th of March, and next Monday, the 21st of March, if you send me an email telling me which of these museums you are thinking of going to and why you think you're interested in that one, I will take whatever your lowest quiz grade is and replace it with a 100. So it's a little extra credit opportunity for you in a way. All right, any questions or concerns, please send me an email. I would love the second half of the class to be uh, more interactive and better than the first half if possible. So if there's anything I can do to help you or if there are any improvements you can think of to make the class better, please don't be afraid to ask or mention it to me. All right, until next time, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.